Thank you very much for that, Graham. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd just like to scotch any rumours which may float around uh, right now that after the Irish thing surfaced, uh, Graham raced around and thought, who do I know who's actually from Ireland can, can speak? Um, um, <laughs> the fact is, he asked me a few days beforehand, um, but I have left a forwarding address just in case anybody's unhappy with the work. <laughs> And that'll go straight into my B for bin file if I do get any complaints. So look, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm probably one of the only people who's um, stood up at your sessions to talk to you, uh, who was actually here during the uh, February 2011 earthquake um, and had a very sporty day at my office uh, over at uh, Woolston. Um, but I want to talk to you about, um, I guess, a couple of things. Um, and as Graham has asked me to, is to have a chat very briefly about the Health and Safety Reform Bill and then a little bit about the Independent Forestry Safety Review and any lessons that might have been learned from that. 20 minutes is not a long time to essentially cram all of that in, so I'm going to talk reasonably quickly. Um, I've had a glass of wine, which means I might be talking a little bit more quickly than I even imagine, so keep up. <laughs> I wrote this last Wednesday, um, and as things do change in health and safety, it's a very dynamic industry. Uh, the Health and Safety Reform Bill is now the Health and Safety um, at Work Act. Um, so clearly we all know things are changing. I'm not sure if you actually understand the structure of legislation and how it actually happens, but this essentially on the left-hand side is, is what we call the hierarchy of legislation. So essentially the new act um, was uh, brought into uh, um, force on Friday. Once that's essentially completed, the new regulations will come out. So you've got regulation on top of that. So, for example, the general uh, 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 regulations will be probably the first set to, to come out. And we saw a very draft uh, 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 example of those today. Then you'll get what we call the tertiary legislation. So essentially, those are effectively codes of practice. So you don't actually have to comply with those. But there are a thing called deemed compliance. If you're complying with that, it's as good as saying you're complying with the Act. And then essentially all the guidance standards and best practice will be constructed uh, over the next two to three years, uh, essentially on the basis of the new act. So you're looking at about three years or so to change all of the, uh, the regs, the uh, codes of practice and the guidance and standards. So I'd love to say it's going to take 24 hours. It's not. It's fairly dynamic. And, and part of that is because we're a democracy and you get your chance to have a say on much of this. So if you do get the chance, you know, um, please contribute. Um, so it clearly is changing. Essentially, in summary, um, over the last few months, I'm not going to talk about worm forms at all. I know nothing about worm forms. Um, but certainly what is, what is changing is critical and, and essentially does affect all of you. This concept of a PCBU, person controlling in business or undertaking, we talk about the idea of reasonably practicable being what you can do. There's now a positive duty of care on officers. Um, why is that different? In short, the guys who were responsible for Pike River weren't convicted because they didn't know there was methane in the mine, okay, at board level. Bad news, if you didn't know it, could not be something which you would be convicted on, okay? Uh, so essentially, today, with the new act in place, if there's bad news, you want to know about it. In the old days, not knowing about it was a defence. It's no longer a defence. So that's where things like worker engagement, so that your workers are talking to you on a regular basis, becomes really important because generally they know more about what's happening than you do as a boss in your business. There's a duty on workers now to actually be safe, to make sure that they are complying with what you tell them or with what your processes are in your industry or in your organisation. And obviously we have new offences and penalties up the wazoo and effectively are, they're about five times higher than the existing penalties. And we don't want that, so we'll crack on with the first stuff. So essentially, we have moved on from do I have a responsibility to what is my responsibility and how do I act to discharge that, okay? So this is the new world we're living in as of Friday night. What does reasonably practicable mean? Um, a couple of years ago, uh, when we looked at this, we, we weren't entirely certain, so we looked to the Australian legislation, because that was effectively the donor legislation for what we had in New Zealand, and they said what essentially can be done should be done unless it is reasonable in the circumstances for the duty holder or the PCBU uh, to do something less. So you start off with do what you have to do unless you can show essentially that doing less is okay. 
WorkSafe New Zealand came out last year and said, actually, if you, uh, actually 2013, if you can't do it safely, don't do it at all. That's a very high bar. That specifically was in relation to forestry. But then actually what is going to happen now is that industry best practice is going to be the defining, um, the, the, the defining what is reasonably possible. So a good example of that here in Christchurch is that you're not using scaffolding for, bu for building residential homes as best practice. Well, if you are building a house and you're not using scaffolding and you have a fall from work or fall from heights issue or incident, it's likely that a court in future will say, well, actually, best practice and what was reasonably practicable was a scaffolded environment. And you failed to discharge your duty in that respect. So I can't guarantee that, but that is very likely what a court will assume. So where you're actually showing best practice to the nation is right here in Christchurch. And I think that's fantastic. So that essentially will become your benchmark for what you have to do going forward. Or that will not be seen. Anything less will not be seen as best practice. Worker participation. Now, this has got lots and lots of coverage recently. I think we're missing the point, OK? Clearly, at this stage, worker participation, as far as the Act is concerned, is out for discussion. So I think what's going to happen is over the next few weeks, we're going to see that come out as a discussion document. And that's going to discuss what is high risk and what is low risk. And while we can all have a laugh around worm farms, the bottom line is construction is seen as pretty much high, high risk. Unless, I think, if you're blowing up buildings, which is not high risk. Which is odd, I have to say, but there you go. Um, I came from Northern Ireland. We, we blew up lots, lots of things, and it always, seemed, it always seemed a very risky business, I have to say. So at this stage, though, as far as you guys are concerned, you're high risk. Um, even if you have got more or less than 20 workers, you will need to be thinking about a health and safety rep uh, and a health and safety committee if one is requested. Whether or not that ends up being the case, watch this um, space. But in terms of engagement, okay, irrespective of however this other bit ends up, okay, the bottom line is that engagement, engagement with your staff on matters of safety is mandatory. Okay, that is not going to change. And that's something which I think you really need to give some consideration to. Personally, my experience of having engaged workers, engaged staff within any industry is that they perform better. Um, and that will be the case in, in, um, uh, in health and safety particularly. So what does engagement actually look like? Right? So I, there's this term SSS. Let me know what SSS stands for. I wrote it three days ago. I had to remind myself what it actually stood for. But SSS, is, that's not bad. That's not bad, sir. Um, wrong, but not bad. Um, <laughs> And no one else is going to answer now because I said that. It's, uh, there there's essentially are three questions that great staff uh, will respond positively to. And they're called say, stay, and strive. Will they say good things about your business when they're in the pub talking to their mates or your potential customers? Will they stay in your business? I, they won't come in, think you're awful to work for and leave, or they won't be looking for another job as soon as they've got there. And will they strive to do their very best? Not just what your job description says they should do, but it's called discretionary effort. And we can all give that. We can all do a little bit more when we need to. That's what a really engaged looking group uh, of workers actually will do. They'll say you're good, they'll stay with you, and they'll strive to do their very, very best. Now, those three things are good in any business. So essentially, how do you engage with your staff? Well, that's exactly what you want to, you want to do. You want to have purposeful conversations that they're actually participating in and contributing to and feeling like they are actually being listened to and being responded to when they say stuff. My wife ask, often asks me, what do you think of this color for our curtains? I know for a fact that that's not an engaging conversation because actually she doesn't care what my, <laughs> what my, what my thoughts on the subject are. She's being nice. And look, to be fair, we've been married 27 years, and that's great, OK? But she also knows that I don't care. That's not an engaged conversation. I, I, I really don't care, OK? <laughs> so if the conversations you're having with your staff are that nature, they're inappropriate. They're not going to lead to an engaged conversation, OK? My wife talks to me about the new car. I'm engaged, OK? That's the conversation you want to have. So if you're thinking about having a conversation with your staff, do that little bit of a test, OK? Does this seem flippant? 
does this seem like I'm really telling them what they want to hear and they're telling me what I want to hear? Because if it is, you're not going to get the outcome that you need for engaged staff. Then you look at things like recording decisions, rotating responsibility. You can all do this, actually. Uh, I've, 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 I've worked with large groups um, in the industry at all levels, from casual staff, no difference whatsoever. You treat your people like they are human beings, and they will all con con contribute. So what does engagement look like? You sit down, you work through hazard identification, process reviews, equipment reviews, and suggestions. What do you think? You know, incident reports, action, follow-up, issue, and close-out, and record them, okay? Make sure you do that. If you don't, you won't have a leg to stand on if, God willing, something goes wrong. Small businesses, we're, I was asked to have a chat about small businesses. I mean, I mean look, essentially, do, doing nothing is not an option. Um, if you do nothing, then for, it's open season for WorkSafe when they come, and uh, they, you know, they won't enjoy it, but you'll enjoy it less. Um, I was asked actually in New Plymouth a couple of weeks ago about when was it best to schedule safety into the working week, genuinely, and, and, and I was very impressed. So <laughs> I said Thursday at four o'clock, and the lady said, why? And I said, you know, literally with complete disdain on my mind, was, well, I mean, it's as good a time as any if that's the way you're thinking. But that's not the way you should be thinking, okay? You need to think about integrating safety into it's just the way you do things in your business and around here. Talk to your associations. I mean, you guys are members of master builders or whoever. Um, I'm sure there's lots of them. They need to be stepping up. Some of them are, some of them aren't. I've had a look at some websites. Some of them are not stepping up. You're paying your fees. Get value for your uh, fees. I would say to you, if you're not part of the um, charter, and I assume you all are, um, then talk to your associations. They have a really big role to play in helping particularly small businesses um, to do um, um, their best to comply. Please don't go out there and buy off-the-shelf safety process, uh, safety systems and think you're covered. Last year when I did the forestry review, the number of people who came up and said, here's my, here's my system, literally. Like this width of, of, of lever arch folders on a flat. So I opened up to sort of this, uh, the seventh file, went to page 42, subsection 3, paragraph 4, and read it out. I said, do you do that? He said, oh, no, we don't do that. Well, I said, well, you failed your audit. You failed because you haven't even gone to the trouble of reading it. And to be honest, it's not that complicated. If you have a look, there's three websites. Have a look at them. Um, um, you just have to get off your backside and do stuff. You guys are getting off your backside. Um, you've got off it, obviously. Um, make safety part of it. And uh, look at what these organizations are saying you should do and, and, and follow it. Most of all, if you can't, ask for help. So that was a brief run through. Forestry Safety Review 2014. These guys had very high fatality and injury rates. Um, essentially, at any one point in time, if we look here, uh, roughly 40% of uh, field force staff had an active ACC claim at any point in time. That's two in five. Okay, we know from the fatality stats on a um, per 100,000 that they are very high, six times the average, uh, and that actually puts, say, construction down here in the orange um, in perspective. Agriculture, of course, is not very risky, uh, so they're just here. <laughs> but why did we get to the point where we had the inquiry? Okay, and, and look, I, I knew nothing about forestry to start, start with, um, but why did the industry decide it needed an inquiry? And it's really this stuff that actually is what causes change. Societal pressure will cause you to lose your license to do business. And, and, and it's, 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 it's a little bit like the well. You never miss the water until the well runs dry. You never really understand this until it's not there, until the press is on your back day in, day out about high uh, uh, fatality rates, um, that actually the government starts to think, is this industry more trouble than it's worth? And that's what was happening to these guys, and they became very uh, aware of it. And these are all real people. I mean, this is, this is, this is not a good picture. And probably I could put up some construction ones here. Now, you're not at the stage where you're losing that ability because you're, you're starting to manage it. But that's something which you need to be really careful of as an industry. Just very briefly, the market structure in New Zealand is roughly 1.7 million hectares are planted. 
an exotic species, which is really out of pine. Uh, we haven't harvested uh, local trees here in New Zealand for a long time. There's roughly 14,000 owners uh, who have less than 10,000 hectares. They're called woodlots. I know 10,000 acres or hectares, a woodlot. Um, and there are essentially 17 large owners who control more than 10,000 hectares, or 64% of the, of the total. There's no market leader in any of them. They're all kind of 10, 11, 12%. Um, and then on the other side, you've got the harvesting guys, the guys who actually do the work. There's hundreds of these guys, um, all relatively small. As far as businesses go, certainly nowhere near the scale of the guys who, can, or who are controlling the industry. Look familiar? Okay. Essentially, though, you get this, right? So forestry owners, they're the guys who own the, the um, trees. They're exposed to market price and demand risk, right? And, and in economics, when you're running a business, you're risk averse. So you offload as much risk as possible to someone else. So contractors, they have all the capital risk. Okay, they own the capital risk and therefore the demand risk. Workers, they own the demand risk. If we don't need you, you don't get paid. That's essentially it. And, and that effectively is it. And over time, that, that essentially drives least cost uh, uh, prevalence as the model for how the industry operates. If I look at a, a harvesting contractor, they're owner operators um, uh, generally. The contracts are, are on a per lot basis if you're working in that 14,000 or a short multi-year basis if you're working for some of the big guys. But the bottom line is no matter what your contract says, it'll have a 30-day notice of termination. Okay? Which isn't so cool if you've spent $10 million capitalizing your business to um, do, say, a full mechanical extraction, which is about what it costs to set one crew up. So, um, you know, you don't really want to go there um, if you're going to actually lose um, your business. The challenge is it's a boom and a bust indus industry. So in bust times, many contractors lose their work or go into short time. In boom times, essentially anyone with a chainsaw can get work. Okay, so there's really very little protection, no barriers to entry to get into the industry. The big guys actually detail on a big spreadsheet exactly what the contract's worth, right down to diesel burn per machine per hour on a contract and they pay you accordingly. So the ability to make a lot of money is not really there. Production is pretty much what drives um, the outcome. So essentially, it doesn't matter how bad the weather is, if you're not on site producing, you don't get paid, largely. And then woodlot owners, they actually won't pay for infrastructure and they want all their work done in the summertime because they can't afford to pay for um, skid sites. So they want you there when the ground's hard and that causes a massive um, um, peak in work in summertime, uh, which obviously pulls the barrier to entry down even further, because they just want the work done. This is interesting, actually. That's a, I, I know you all recognize what that is, right? That's, 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 do you know what that, that is? <laughs> that's a sign that I respect my staff. OK, it's as simple as that. Um, I, I visited probably 60 odd um, um, uh, uh, wood sites, and each one of them, uh, you go to the, the bathroom, you get offered a spade. And they wonder why there are no women in the industry. There's not a single uh, example of this in the industry. But so it's, and it's a school of hard knocks, so that's the paradox. Uh, the owners generally don't feel the need to look after their staff in this respect because that's the way they were treated. And it's okay, because I've done my best, I've pulled, pulled myself up. And therefore, there's no water, there's no toilets, there's no heat, and there's no shelter. All of which are actually required under the guidelines that were issued to forestry um, um, industry in 1994. So they just aren't there. Interestingly, you look at the workforce. Again, maybe some similarities. Just under 7,000, so quite small, actually, in terms of um, construction. 94% um, are male. 21.5% aged between 15 and 25 are four, compared with 15.9% of the total, 8% over 55. So there are very few old, bold workers in the forestry industry. It is a tough young person's gig. Um, on average, a breaker route will actually run more than the distance of a marathon during a shift. And that's all uphill and downhill. Two tree lengths, particularly in Gisborne, where trees are very tall, is a long way. 
43% are in training all the time, 45% workers change job within 12 months, and uh, big Maori pop population, no union representation, 30 people actually are registered with the uh, unions uh, out of the 7,000. But this term actually comes out quite often. They're called bottom of the barrel or wins guys. When you talk to the owners, regularly you'll hear this term. And that really gets my goat actually, that makes my blood boil because that is a license for you to treat people worse than yourself. If you ever catch yourself doing that, get somebody to give yourself a kick up the ass because it is, it, is, it is the slippery slope to being a bad person. You have a look at the workers. 56% get one break per day, uh, roughly eight to 10 hours, 30 minutes or less. 67% paid to provide their own safety equipment, illegal. 60% training would make them safer, so they're not stupid. 58% um, did not suffer adverse weather. 51% reported no fresh water on site. 24% reported being aware of drug impaired co workers. 24% in the most dangerous industry in our country. And I'd be happy to stand beside that guy with a large still chainsaw who's dropping seven ton stems every two minutes. Don't think so. Most would not report their colleagues though, because that's narking. We don't do that. Okay? Um, they didn't feel the need for a, 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 a union or even rep rep representation. Um, and actually, most of them would leave their, um, leave their um, current boss for an incremental 50 cents per hour. I'll crack on. So what do we know? The situation is complex. All parties at all levels in the industry tend to focus on themselves. They were not a wealthy industry by and large. Much of it was on, on an SME basis, which actually, for most of us, is the Kiwi dream, right? We want our own business, be our own boss. So you need to find a solution that actually accommodates that. Labour's unrepresented, needs a voice, but doesn't want one. Um, widespread system failure and leadership was definitely, definitely struggling. So our vision was safe, sustainable and professional sector by 27 achieved in partnership by government, industry and workers. We had, it was a 145 page report. You can read it at your leisure if you wish, or actually click on the website and there's a three minute video, tell you all you need to know. Um, <laughs> and, um, Look, really there's no silver bullet in this industry. Um, um, it's complex and, you, you know, I, I guess it's one of the things I said to health and safety people here, if it is health and safety um, professionals. Okay, when you're under pressure to actually make things really simple and your boss says, I need the silver bullet, you know, just, just, just fix it, try and resist that because most often that doesn't work, you know that. Um, tell them they're stupid um, or words to that effect. But that's why this was essentially a very complex recommendation because there's no point in saying you need more training without actually providing for training but actually providing for a mandate for the training organisations to deliver it. Um, you need to create barriers to entry so we created certified workforce scheme to professionalise the or or organisation. But this one was critical. Leadership was really missing um, and I'm glad to say that actually that's not the case here. So, Sorry, I don't quite sure why this is coming up the way it is, but essentially I was asked then for some thoughts to your industry. And look, the challenge here is that there are huge <coughs> pressures, competitive pressures, in my view, on subcontractors, right? There are huge com pr pressures all through the organization. Graham didn't vet this with me, by the way, so these are my thoughts, not necessarily anybody else's, all right? Um, I guess the investment incentive is probably weak. Um, Safety, I mean, do I see safety built into procurement right across the, the, the industry? And the, and, and the answer to that is no. Okay, so I think government, local council needs to take a really hard look at this and step up to the plate. Lowest common denominator existed for sure in forestry. If you've got four guys who do their best, who make sure the guys have high vis, toilets, um, they've got good safety systems, they've got good records, and they're a cent more expensive per tonne than some rat bag contractor who'll come in and do it for literally as cheap as they can do it, don't give a rat's about safety, and if they get the job, what's it saying about the industry? What message is it sending to everybody in your in industry? And that's what's driven forestry to this point. Lowest cost was the primary driver. So you need to give consideration to that. It's a tough call. Safety is a thing in this environment. I think safety is still a bit of a thing here. I'm not sure it's a culture yet. We're still a, a can-do culture. If you can change that to can-do safely, you'll be away. Workers, geez, show these guys respect. 
You know, they may have left school at 16. They may not have any academic qualifications. So did my brother. He's a bin man. He's happier than I am. <laughs> but he's a good bloke. And I wouldn't want to see him any less safe at what he does than at what I am because he chose, he chose to leave school. It's not a reason for treating people badly. Work engagement, as I said, have a look at what I, I wrote. It's very straightforward, but find a model that works and, and understand there is economic pressure on workers. You know, people say to me, oh, the guys don't complain. Really? They live in Tokoroa for crying out loud. What else are they going to do? Think about it from your perspective. Lots of your guys won't complain. They won't tell you a lot of what you need to know because there's economic pressure on them. They have to put, you know, put food on the table when they get home. It's critical. Training is absolutely critical. Supervision, what we saw in forestry, when it peaked, okay, when, when activity peaked, basically guys who didn't really know what they were doing came into the industry, and the zero to five years fatality and injury rates are four times higher than they are beyond five years. It's horrendous. Don't have time when they come in to get really trained. No supervision or limited supervision, which is two days. Yeah, you know how to oil your saw and do your chain. Cool, you're off. Okay, if that's the same in your industry, which we're peaking right now in Christchurch, or coming close to, your training and supervision is critical. Leadership, your business and industry leadership needs to be absolutely imperative. So you're lucky you've got this safety charter group. I think I'd love to see you develop a, th a three-year plan and, and, and really go on this um, journey, change the industry. You can do it, not just for Christchurch, which is really important, but you can do it for New Zealand, if you really think about it. Be aware that economic imperatives often override safety. They do. You know, if you've given the guys a deadline, guess what? They're going to do the deadline first. It's always the case. I saw it even in a business that I chair quite recently, where the staff member walked past the safety equipment and put her hand into the machine, losing the tip of her finger. Luckily, she wasn't a guitar player, but she'll never be one, because she was in a hurry. Okay? And despite the lockouts, the tags, etc., she did the wrong thing. But I was responsible. Industry bodies have a really important role to play. So site safe master builders, you guys can all get them to step up. Risk minimization is no substitute for elimination. This is a very, very quick one for occupational health. When I see people running around with headphones on, ear defenders, okay, it just simply says that you haven't engineered a quiet environment. And mostly you can do that. So in whatever it is that you're doing, okay, if you're using PPE or whatever on a prolonged basis, I'm not talking about high vis uh, you know, essentially that says your systems have not failed because risk minimization should be a short-term thing. There are ways of engineering better outcomes, okay? And I think you can try that too. So luckily you've got this charter. I'm a really big believer in it. We quoted it in the forestry inquiry because it's leadership. Hey, it's not perfect, but it's a great environment where your guys come together to move things forward. I'd love to see a few more smaller businesses around that table. But volunteer, guys. They're not going to come and look for you. Volunteer. That's it. Why couldn't that be your long-term objective? I mean sustainable in the broadest sense. Making money, everybody feeling good about it, long-term future. Thanks very much. <laughs>